Austin here, AKA Forbidden Knowledge. Hoping we can get everybody on this live tonight. I'm looking to live stream and uh, we're gonna live stream on this brand new platform that I'm testing out called Riverside. So let's see, as I'm looking down, I'm just trying to check and see if everyone is live in the, uh, in the live chat. So if you give me a second, I'm gonna just check this. I'm testing this for the very first time. It looks like we are live, so that's a good thing. And uh, like I said before, I just wanna make sure that everything is functioning just right. It's a brand new platform. I wanna come on here tonight and talk to you about the solar eclipse. And I wanna talk about the science behind the solar eclipse tonight, okay? That's really what I wanna talk about. So I'm just checking this live stream. Again, this is a, a great test for me today to see how this new platform performs, uh, see what it can do. And uh, I'm looking to see now if I can see anyone in this live chat, okay? So that I can communicate with you guys back and forth in real time. And I see the chat is live. All right. Okay, thanks for popping in guys. I know it's a, a random pop-up. Uh, we haven't done the Biohack Your Best Life podcast in a little while with Elizabeth Carson, my wife. Uh, she's been really, really busy, and we both really have been busy, but she's been extremely busy uh, helping to plan and build the next step for Forbidden Knowledge, Inc. So we hope to bring that back to you probably Monday of next week or Friday of this week, but we will reschedule the Biohack Your, podcast, Biohack Your Best Life podcast for some time this week. Uh, it's just a, lo a lot going on right now, a lot of great things going on, good news. It's not bad news. It's phenomenal. But we um, are looking forward to getting that rescheduled, all right? Tonight, I want to talk about the science behind the actual eclipse. Um, when I set up this live stream, I didn't know how it was going to show up or how it would uh, you know, present itself with a subject line or a caption or whatever. Kind of a unique setup on this Riverside app. But I want to test it out. Uh, and see how it worked and see the clarity and everything else. So I'm testing it out right now and um, we'll see. I'm going to, I'm going to give it a, I'm going to give it a go tonight. All right. I see everyone filling up in the chat. Thank you so much. Make sure you guys please click the like button and please share the video. I'll be talking tonight about the science of solar eclipses. And so I'm going to get uh, pretty studious tonight. I'm going to go over, you know, some, some, um, some of the science behind how a solar eclipse works, okay? And so it's gonna be hopefully not too dry, but I definitely wanna break the science down because I think a lot of people don't really understand how a solar eclipse works. Um, it's really based on science and planetary alignments and orbital mechanics. You've heard me talk about orbital mechanics before if you've been following my account you know, for any period of time. And you know that um, it's something that I talk about with regards to asteroids, comets. Uh, I talked about it when we talked about Amua Amua, uh, that object, that interstellar object that passed through our solar system and kind of looked like it used our sun uh, uh, as a uh, you know as a as a directionary thing to project itself back out into interstellar space, kind of like um, it used our sun for the ability to like slow itself down and regain a new orbit and then shoot itself out. And so it's pretty interesting. I had Avi Loeb on uh, in that uh, podcast and we talked about the whole Amua Amua object and what he thinks it might be. Uh, and Avi Loeb is the astrophysics professor at Harvard University, okay? So yeah, I mean, it looked like it used the sun for a gravitational assist is what, what I think it did. Could I be wrong? Possibly, but Avi Loeb and many other astrophysicists tend to believe that it seemed like it used our sun as a as a gravitational assist. And when you're talking about gravitational assist, you're talking about something that's technical. You're talking about engineering. You're talking about programming. You're talking about program trajectories. So it's pretty interesting how Oumuamua came through our solar system, used our sun, kind of like a gravitational assist and shot itself right back out into deep space, all right? Uh, but yeah, so tonight I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the solar eclipse. I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have seen it uh, today. Not everyone could see it because in some areas it was a partial eclipse. In some areas it was a full eclipse, 
okay? And so let's talk a little bit about solar eclipses. And while I'm uh, doing this, I just want to, from time to time, I'm going to go back and check the live chat because I can't see the live chat uh, on this uh, screen that I'm in. So from time to time, I'm going to flip back and forth and just check out the live chat, all right? Okay, cool. I see New Zealand's in the house. Olga Mays, what's up, Olga? All right. Kimberly, Matthew, David Elson. All right. AJ Pondexter, Latoya Akers. Thanks for hopping on, guys. I appreciate you. Fox, Phoenix. All right. Dade Breeze, coming from Iowa. All right. Richard Mead, what's up? E Snap from Coco. Divine Timing, Peace Love. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate y'all. Lori Stalker from Phoenix. All right. So now that I know it's working properly, my voice is, is fine. You guys can hear me okay. I'm going to go through and talk a little bit about these eclipses, okay? A solar eclipse is when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun. So it's, the, it's, it's, a, it's an, a particular type of alignment that happens, okay? You have the Earth, and then you have the moon, and you have the sun. Well, the moon passes between the earth and the sun. And this is what's giving you the obscuring effect that creates an eclipse, a solar eclipse, okay? A lunar eclipse is a little bit different, but today we're talking about a solar eclipse. And so now you, it can obscure the entire sun or it can partially obscure the sun like it did today in some areas and where you can see some of the eclipse from some places and some of the eclipse, you know, a full eclipse from other places. So depending on where you were today, I heard Texas was a really good place to see a full eclipse. But in other places where I was, like in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, we couldn't see the disc completely get covered. We got a great view and we saw probably about, I would say, 90% of the sun covered by the suns, by the moon but we couldn't get to see 100% of the moon covering over the disk of the sun because of our location on earth. And why is that? That's because the earth is not flat guys. That's pretty much why that's how solar eclipses work. They don't work on flat planets. They work on spheres. Um, and so now this alignment can only happen during a new moon phase when the sun and the moon are in conjunction. So in conjunction as seen from earth in a particular alignment, and so there's a few scientific components that can help you to process and create, uh, to process how a solar eclipse can be created. And so the first one we're going to talk about is, I kind of touched on this before, orbital mechanics. So when the Earth and the Moon orbit the Sun, but they do it at different speeds along a slightly different path, the Earth orbits the Sun basically, you know, once a year. We know that already. But the Moon orbits the Earth and it orbits the Earth approximately once per month, okay? And so we have, so again, we have the Earth going around the Sun once every 12 months, 365 days, 365.5 days, actually 365.25 days, and then you have the Moon orbiting the Earth while it's orbiting the Sun, and the Moon is orbiting uh, the Earth once a month, okay? And the moon is in a geostationary lock, which means we can only see one side of the moon from almost any position on Earth, give or take, you know, a little. But the, because the moon is rotating on its axis at the same speed the Earth is rotating on its axis, we only get to see most of one side of the moon at any given time. Now, that's pretty interesting because the way our moon is geostationary locked with Earth's rotation, it almost seems like somebody put that program in place or set that up that way to create that rotation. Why? I personally believe that the other side of the moon, which they call the dark side, which is not really dark. It's just that it's the side that we can't see from Earth. It's a great place to set up camp and create a base and do experimentations and exploration and everything else without the peering eyes of humans on Earth. That's my personal opinion, okay? There's something else called CGG. I know that's a weird name, okay? Syzygy. Now, syzygy is a term used to describe the alignment of three celestial bodies. So we're talking about, in ancient times, they considered syzygy the Holy Trinity. Yeah, the Holy Trinity was considered syzygy. 
And that is the alignment between three celestial bodies. And those celestial bodies are the earth, the moon, and the sun. It's an alignment of three celestial bodies in a straight line. And during a solar eclipse, the alignment is specifically of the earth, the moon, and the sun in that order in a perfect alignment that allows the eclipse to occur. Okay. And during this alignment, a lot of the people in ancient times, they really believed that this was a sign from God, that it was a, a you know, it was a holy time in the heavens. It was a new beginning, a fresh, a fresh start, right? A lot of people would do things like, uh, unfortunately, in some of the cultures, they would sacrifice virgins. <laughs> I know it doesn't make any sense to me either. How can you be an advanced civilization with pyramids like the ones like the Mayans and the Aztecs and then begin to sacrifice little girls? It's because those people didn't build any of that stuff. It was already there. They inherited what was already there. They were still barbaric people at the time. Uh, that you know, that they that they inherited that that land and lived there, um, and then others would do things like plant new crops, sow new fields, uh, you know, so many different dance rituals and drum rituals and prayer rituals and so forth, worship rituals, all centered around these types of celestial alignments. So, there's a few different types of solar eclipses, um, you know. One occurs when the moon is completely covered. Uh, I'm sorry, when the moon completely covers over the sun. All right, that's one where you can see the sun's disk. So you can see the moon cover the sun, and then you can just see the outside edge of the sun. You can just see the outside edge just glowing around the moon. All right, that's a total solar eclipse. Okay, that's so you're looking at the corona, right, of the sun. Uh, and now this can be viewed from uh, specific places on earth only. If you're in the wrong place, you won't be able to see that. Like today, people in Texas got to see that, but people like myself in Florida, we couldn't see that, okay? Now, it can happen when the moon's disk is slightly larger than that of the sun, which kind of blocks out the majority of the sun, and then you just see that glow from the backside. Uh, and I know today when I looked up, the way the sun was shining, it was so bright. It literally felt like it was burning my eyes. And I had on a pair of sunglasses and I, it still felt like when I close my eyes, I can see these, these dots. And every time I blinked, I could see these dots for a while. It took about an hour to go away. So it's very dangerous. You're not supposed to look directly at the sun. In ancient times, they would take a disc of obsidian and they would hold that over their face. And then they would look at the solar eclipse through the obsidian because obsidian is translucent, you can see through it, even though it's jet black. But when you hold it up to the sun, you realize that you can see through the obsidian. And that's how they would observe. Um, that's how they would, they meaning the Teotihuacans, that's how they would observe the solar eclipse, the Mayans and the Aztecs and so forth down in Chichen Itza, in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, in Teotihuacan, which is now in, in Mexico, near Mexico City, uh, in Coba and all those other places. That's how they would do it. They would use that obsidian, a disc of obsidian to observe it. So it's pretty, pretty cool. I mean, I've done it before. When I went to Teotihuacan, I bought an obsidian disc and I held it up at the sun. And sure enough, you can look right at the sun and you can see it right through the obsidian. It, it's, it's just, you know, and how these people knew these things is mind boggling. But um, you can go down there right now. If you go to Teotihuacan, and go to one of the local shops, make sure you get a chance to buy a piece of obsidian of obsidian disc that you can hold up at the sun, okay? Now, um, let's also talk a little bit about uh, the partial solar eclipse, which is what I kind of saw today. It happens only when part of the sun is obscured by the moon, and this occurs when the sun, the moon, and the earth are not exactly aligned. So it's slightly off from, you know, from there. Now you also have an annular solar eclipse when the moon is near its apogee, which is, means it's the furthest point. Apogee is the furthest point. If you're anybody in astrophysics or science talking about or orbital mechanics and I say apogee, you're talking about the furthest point away from the Earth or the sun. And in perigee would be its closest point. Apogee, perigee, okay? For example, Mars is uh, in a very strange, weird elliptical orbit around our sun. And so that's why missions to Mars 
are only every two years because every two years it's in perigee. And so when it's in perigee, it's its closest point. So we rendezvous with the planet. It only takes about four months versus when it's in apogee, it would take almost a year and a half to get there because of the weird orbit that it has. So a launch window, the perfect launch window to Mars is every two years on its apogee. I mean, on its perigee. Apogee is the furthest, perigee is the closest, okay? Giving you guys some basic astrophysics terms here, all right? And so that's uh, just a little cool tidbit there, you know, un understanding that Mars and m most of the planets in our solar system, they don't orbit in a perfect circle. They actually have this swing where sometimes they're closer, sometimes they're further away, just like Earth. Earth doesn't orbit the sun in a perfect circle either. As a matter of fact, uh, maybe one day, I, I know I posted this way back in 2013 on Forbidden Knowledge on Instagram, but our planets actually chase the sun as they're, as they're orbiting. And as they're doing this and chasing the sun, which is orbiting the Milky Way galaxy, the sun is, it creates this pattern, right? This pattern, which is what? The double helix. We're talking about DNA. Maybe I'll overlay that image or video clip of that over my voice when this airs, maybe I'll have it re-edited later and I'll put it on Forbidden Knowledge TV, re-edit it because we do that from time to time, okay? Um, but yeah, so the planets actually don't orbit the sun. They chase the sun while they kind of orbit it, but the sun itself is moving. The sun is moving. The sun is orbiting the Milky Way. And so these kind of alignments are pretty cool. Uh, you know, the moon will cover the center of the sun's disk, leaving a bright angular ring-shaped outer edge uh, of the sun. And then you have the hybrid solar eclipse. It's also known as the hybrid angular total eclipse. These are rare and occur when the same eclipse changes from an annular to a total eclipse and vice versa along different sections of its path. And this only happens due to the curvature of the Earth. So because the Earth is curved, you can get a hybrid eclipse, which happens from time to time, okay? Depending on its variations in surface elevations. And so right now I'm in Florida, which is more of a flat elevation. The land here is not very hilly, not a lot of mountains here, no mountains here. <laughs> and versus being maybe somewhere like West Virginia, which does have mountains. Uh, so you get this differential between high land and low land, sea level and above sea level, okay? And so, yes, uh, you know, this is pretty cool stuff. I mean, anyone who's looking into these solar eclipses and really trying to understand how they work, it's just pretty cool stuff. You have the Umbra and Penubra, uh, you know, version. Now, during an eclipse, two types of shadows are actually cast by the moon onto Earth. And the umbra is the innermost and the darkest part where the sun completely obscures. And this leads to a total eclipse for observers within its, um, its shadow. So if you're in the shadow of the moon, when that happens, you're going to see a total eclipse, OK? And the penubra is the outer shadow where the sun is partially obscured, and that results in a partial eclipse. So you can be in the shadow of the moon, and if you're in that shadow path, like today, you can actually get to see um, you know, the, the umbra, which is the, the, the full eclipse. And we also have the Saros cycle. And in the Saros cycle, solar eclipses tend to occur in cycles known as Saros cycles, which last approximately 18 years and 11 days and eight hours. This cycle is related to the synchronization of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun in orbital periods, allowing similar eclipses based on your geometry and your location uh, to repeat over and over again in time. A solar eclipse is a striking demonstration of celestial mechanics and the precise alignments required for such an event to occur. And so solar eclipses are pretty cool. I mean, this was a great one. I've seen quite a few in my lifetime. Uh, I like observing them and being a part of them and just kind of, you know, taking photos and videos. I remember back, I think it was 20, it might've been 2017. 
I had a chance to take my telescope with a recording device on it to the top of a tall building to catch that solar eclipse and record it. So I got a great image of the moon just covering over the sun in slow motion. I slowed it down. Phenomenal image. I did it with my Celestron 130 uh, telescope. And so if you get a chance to get a telescope and or you get a chance to observe some of these solar eclipses or some of this you know, spatial phenomenon, always try to take a moment to do it. Look for meteor showers and, you know, comets and asteroids that are going to be that are going to be nearby and maybe visible. Uh, I just remember over the years seeing so many great things in the sky, uh, getting a chance to just take some time away from the family and reflect on the the glory of the heavens, you know, so much, so many beautiful things in the heavens and the skies. Um, and to be able to just understand that we are all a part of something so much bigger, you know, for me, the eclipse, you know, a lot of people were contacting me about the eclipse and they were, they were afraid. They were asking if they needed to, needed to, you know, uh, save up on, on food, start stack up on food and water and supplies. And was the earth going to have a major earthquake and, you know, so forth and so on. And I kept telling people, no, it's just going to be a beautiful day. Just be ready to observe it and take it all in. And for me, when these solar eclipses come around, you know, you only get so many in one lifetime because, hey, you know, let's face it, in this dimension, in this corporeal body, you know, I'm only going to get so many opportunities like this to observe celestial phenomenon. So I, I try to take it in. I try to enjoy it. I reflect on it and realize that I'm part of something so much bigger. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't make me feel small. It makes me feel grand. It makes me feel incredible to know that that actual asteroid or that comet or that eclipse or whatever it is going on out there in space is actually part of me. It's a reflection of myself and it's a reflection of you as well, right? Like the minds used to say, in la kek a la ken, I am another you. We're all part of this great grand journey as we are all on top of a gigantic spaceship flying through the universe. This, this, this spaceship called Earth, it's a spaceship and we're flying through the universe. Uh, you know, and it's, it's really amazing to understand if you can get the depth of knowledge and understand that everything that's out there is also in here. It's inside of us. Everything is a fractal. We are all part of the same thing. We are all energetically connected. And as above, so below, everything that we witness on the outside happening is also happening on the inside. We can take something like an eclipse as a metaphor for our own lives, right? In other words, there's several ways to look at it. When you stand in the shadow or the umbra, you have a chance to see the solar eclipse. You can see, you can see the sun's corona. And what does that mean metaphorically in your own life? Well, if you look at your own life and realize that we all have shadows, right? We have shadows. Those shadows are the things that, are, that we have decided to lock away or keep away or don't tell anybody, keep secret. Traumas that have happened in our lives, right? Situations that have happened that have traumatized us mentally, physically, spiritually. That's the shadow. And so sometimes you must go outside and face the shadow. Like today was a day to go outside and stand in the shadow for those who had an opportunity. Every single day we have an opportunity to stand up to the shadows within our own self, the umbras within our own self, and face those shadows and begin to do the shadow work. And when you stand in the shadow, you begin to take a peer inside of yourself and realize the shadows that are in there, and then you begin to work on those shadows, then you begin to see this glow around the edges because the light always wins. And it means it's time for you to go in and do the shadow work and work on yourself, better yourself, become a better person, find out the things that triggered you in the past, the things that tr traumatized you in the past, the things that hurt you in the past and address them, address them in a way that is productive. In other words, feel those emotions, work through them, see how those things that happened in the past that created those shadows are linked to things that are affecting you now today, and then begin to work through those things. Write down these traumas, write down these situations. This whole thing is a metaphor for what's happening inside. You want the shadow of the past through 
and then illuminate again and, and, and let the light shine, well, you have to go inside and begin to do the shadow work. Another way you can look at it as well is you need to understand that we are all going through life on a particular path, right? Just like that shadow took a path across the earth today, we are all on a path. There are over 101 ways to enlightenment. And that's a plug for Elizabeth Carson's new TV show, 101 Ways to Enlightenment on Forbidden Knowledge TV. But it's true. We are all on a different path, right? Different paths to enlightenment. And you may bump into somebody that may be on a path that you, and from your perspective, doesn't seem like the right path. But you can't judge that person. You can give them encouragement. You can give them enlightenment. You can try to give them some guidance. But ultimately, they are on their own path. They are on their own grand journey. Okay, just like our Earth is on its own grand journey through the universe. Same thing. They have to eventually get into alignment, just like the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun has to get into a special alignment for you to see that illuminating glow around the Sun. When that alignment happens in that person's life, then they will begin to, to see their own glow, and others will begin able to see that glow but they have to become, they have to get into alignment. And that alignment, sometimes it, it takes, it takes time. It takes wisdom. It takes understanding. It's a journey. And there's not one particular path to get there. So you can't beat people up or you can't be angry at people because they are not where you perceive they should be. They're exactly where they're supposed to be. You see? And when another thing that happens when you do that, you let go. You let go of the burden that you're putting on your own self of where somebody else is in their journey. I see it happening all the time. People are always putting all the burden on themselves for someone else's journey. There's a there's an old you know a, a, an old metaphor that, you know, it's been used for, for a very long time, probably hundreds of years, but I added a little something extra to it. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink just because you're thirsty. <laughs> That's the part I added. You can't be thirsty for someone else, right? You can't. You have to be, uh, you know, true to yourself, true to your path, provide guidance and wisdom and inspiration for others. But like I said, at the end of the day, they have to find their own way. And so it's a, you know, it's a great day. It's a day of renewal. You can look at eclipses as a time or a moment for renewing, for renewing anything, renewing vows with the person that you love, renewing your spirit and understanding that you're giving yourself forgiveness you can't look on the outside for forgiveness. You have to look on the inside for forgiveness. If you are waiting, hoping, and wishing, and begging an outside source or some deity to come down and forgive you for everything you did in your life, you missed the boat. The mission is for you to understand that you are your own savior and you're here to forgive yourself. This is where a lot of people carry a lot of dark trauma, which leads into shadows that they take everywhere they go. Literally, they, they're walking around with casting shadows everywhere because they haven't forgiven themselves for things that have happened in some cases decades ago. And it's just as simple as looking at yourself in the mirror and wholeheartedly, heartfelt, looking at yourself and saying to yourself, I forgive me. I forgive myself. I forgive myself for this, 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 and this, whatever it was. The next step after that is to understand exactly what you're forgiving yourself for and what got you into that predicament or situation or how you allowed yourself to get into that situation. And then the next step is learning from it. Once you learn from it, now you're growing consciously. You're ascending consciously. And what will happen is, as you learn and take those life's lessons, 
In other words, you didn't squander the opportunity by just making a mistake after mistake after mistake and not even acknowledging them. You're taking ownership for your own mistakes. And you're learning from those mistakes and you're putting solutions in place to allow yourself to never be put in that position again. Now you've been born again in the spirit. Now you have been born again. You see? And you'll be born again many times in one lifetime if you keep up that great work. Stop hoping some space daddy is going to come down and wave a magic wand and go, bing, I forgive you. And you're going to be like, oh, I'm good to go now. And then you go around the corner and go straight to the strip club, drink a whole bunch of alcohol and go drunk driving that night, crash into somebody. And then you got to do it all over again. Oh, please forgive me. And in your mind, you think some space daddy is coming down and bing, you're forgiven. Okay. And then you go the next day outside to uh, the local park and, you know, and you, you see something you don't like, somebody you don't like, you curse them out. And it's just a cycle of no accountability, of no accountability. At the end of the day, when are we going to take accountability for everything that we're doing? You know, today, uh, I'm going to say this and I'm going to wrap up tonight because it's a short night for me. I, um, we have our team meetings, our forbidden knowledge team meetings every two weeks. This is our employees. And we have our employees come on uh, to a live Zoom. And then we have, we talk to them. Uh, we talk about updates with the company, things that need to be done where everybody's at. If we bring on a new team member, like today we had a new team member come on, shout out to Clear, um, and everybody's job duties and just a checkup on what's going on and how to collaborate and coordinate with one another in a proper way to make sure everything is getting done properly. What can we do to improve and so forth and so on. And then we have Tim Story come on. Tim Story is a great business and life coach and he comes on and he works with them for about an hour. And we do this every two weeks, like clockwork. But we also implemented something about uh, maybe 70 days ago. It was a 90-day challenge. And in this 90-day challenge, it was uh, that we were all supposed to write down five positive affirmations, five things that we're grateful for in the morning in this app that we all share, this employment app that we have, this company app. And then so everyone can see it. It's accountability. Uh, also, we have our exercise routines that are supposed to be checked off. And um, our exercise routines are in our, in our meditation, 10 minute meditation every single day, that also must be checked off. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because today during this meeting, uh, we're talking about accountability. I have been going on some trips. I went to go film a documentary and a TV series and a few other things. And I still no excuse, I got off track. I didn't write down my five, uh, my five things that I'm grateful for. I didn't uh, mark off my exercises routines when I did even work out. Some days I worked out fine, like, you know, and I didn't mark it off. Um, and uh, in a few days I missed my meditation, right? And so now I know that other people are probably falling off as well in, in, in there because I can get the notifications and see who's marking these things to be done and who's not. But instead of putting on the ego and acting like I was almighty and I was the perfect person that had been doing everything right, I held myself accountable. And I told the team today, I said, hey guys, you know, we started this 90 day challenge and we got up to a phenomenal start, every one of us. But I'm gonna be the first to tell you, I kind of fell off on this a little bit. I got caught up in and saying, thinking I was too much work and I was doing this and I was doing that and I was all over the place. And, and I, I missed out on, you know, marking off some of my exercises, my workout routines. I, 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 mark, I didn't mark up, I didn't uh, write in my, my, uh, my things that I'm grateful for. I missed some of my meditations and I'm gonna hold myself accountable for that because I'm the leader. And I know everyone, you know, here probably has missed a little something here or there. Uh, but I'm letting you know that, you know, we're going to kick it back up again. We're going to start it back up. We're going to finish strong. We all, we kind of fell off a little bit, but we're going to finish real strong. And I'm going to tell you from, from myself that I, as being the leader, that I'm the main one that actually fell off and, and, and didn't fulfill 
um, you know, the, um, you know, the 90 day challenge as it should have been done every single day. I missed some days and just being honest like that and, and forthcoming and telling people like, Hey, I messed up, man, but we're going to fix this problem and we're going to finish strong. You see, being conscious is not about being perfect. And I think that's where people get it wrong. Being conscious is not about being perfect. Being conscious is about understanding your imperfections and addressing them and reeling yourself back in so you can get back on track very quickly before it goes too far. When you're not conscious, when you're following religions and dogma and things like that, you're just an NPC wandering through the universe. You have no clue what you're doing or who you are. And you'll go off on tangents and do all kind of crazy stuff and blame everything on the outside of you and never look in yourself in the mirror. That's the state of the world. You see? At the end of the day, what a true adept initiate is, is a person that understands their imperfections and works on them on a daily basis, seeking to correct prior wrongs, seeking to do better the next time, seeking to learn from past mistakes. The ideology of being a perfect person to make it into some heaven is a farce. The reality is, you need to be accountable for every decision that you make. It's one of the hermetic laws that exist in the universe, right? One of the seven hermetic principles. One of the principles is the principle of cause and effect. Every decision you make is going to have a consequence. And I mean every decision. It can be a good consequence or a bad consequence, but I guarantee you there will be a consequence. I guarantee it. So we need to be able to think properly about these decisions that we're making and not making and what consequence is going to happen based on cause and effect instead of maneuvering through the world like an NPC. Right? Non-player character. That's what that means, a non-player character. A soulless avatar that operates on matrix programming. That's what that means. All right. So, you know, it's a, it's a great day, man. You know, I just wanted to drop a little bit of knowledge on you guys. I'm testing out this new, this new streaming service. I'm just trying to see if I like it. I'm streaming from another platform, another platform. Um, I think it's okay, but I don't like the fact that I can't see the live chat without going to a live chat window separately from the video viewer that I'm on. However, it's seems to be pretty decent. Maybe I'll use this specifically for things like podcasting or doing a podcast with someone. But anyway, I hope you guys all had a beautiful and blessed day. It was a beautiful eclipse out there. For those of you who couldn't get to see it, you can go to my Instagram account at forbiddenknowledge.com and you can check it out. And don't forget, we have the Forbidden Tour of Egypt coming up. You can go to forbiddenknowledge.com and click on that link. And then uh, at the top, it says uh, tours. Click on the link tour and you can register and come hang out with me in Egypt for 12 days. And I'll lecture for seven of those 12 days. I'll take you on flights all throughout Egypt. We'll go on private excursions and down the Nile and on private VIP Mercedes Benz buses through the desert and go see some of the most amazing sites you thought you'd never see. And we'll do it in a VIP way with exclusive private access. And our private access gives us the ability to go to ancient sites when there's no tourists there so we can have the entire place to ourselves. If you wanna do that with us, make sure you go to forbiddenknowledge.com and click on the Forbidden Tours link and make sure you register ASAP. All right, guys, I'm gonna get out of here. I appreciate y'all. It was um, a great little talk tonight. Hopefully I shared something that could help somebody. And I'll be back again.